Hi everyone. Today we're going to just briefly cover neuroanatomy. There are some terms and ideas that people get confused in this section sometimes. I want to go over it briefly um, and then we will actually um, just cover the surface. Your SGA will get into these quite a bit more. So these are some of those anatomical terms that you'll run into and that people really get stuck on sometimes. So let me go ahead and go to the uh, diagram page because I feel like that's more helpful. So rostral translates to beak in Latin uh, and caudal translates to tail. And in humans, most animals that ends up translating to essentially like forward and back. Uh, dorsal also means back, but that's also superior. So if you think about the dorsal fin on something like a dolphin, right? So it's gonna be up above the body. So here's where you see dorsal and then ventral uh, refers to the stomach. It's also referred to as inferior. Uh, then you have anterior, uh, that, or sometimes just called frontal, that means in the front. And then you have posterior, uh, which I think we all know means behind, right? Um, and then lateral means on the side. And then medial uh, is the center, or in between, okay? So you're up here in the center. Um, and a couple other things that are helpful here. Structures that are on the same side of the brain are called ipsilateral, on the same side. Uh, those that are on the different sides of the brain are called contralateral, different sides. Uh, things that are in both hemispheres are bilateral, pretty easy. Structures that are close together are called proximal. St structures that are further apart are called distal, distal like distant. And then the last thing you need to know here for these weird anatomical terms are efferent and afferent. So efferent is moving away from the brain. Um, so motor messages, for example, move in that direction. Uh, and afferent is movement towards the brain. And for example, sensory pathways carry uh, information from our outer neurons up back to the brain. Makes sense. All right, so the nervous system uh, is quite well organized and has several uh, parts in which it's organized. And we're going to get into some of the different ways that it is organized. So you've got the central nervous system, which is what we typically think of when we think of the nervous system, and that's your brain and your spinal cord. And then you've got your somatic nervous system. Those are your cranial and spinal nerves. Um, and it's both to and from the sensory organs and muscles, joints, skin, etc. Uh, produces movement and transmits incoming sensory info to the central nervous system. And then you've got the autonomic nervous system, which we're all glad we have. Uh, this balances the body's internal organs. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is what speeds everything up. It's your fight or flight. The parasympathetic is what calms everything back down. We're gonna skip ahead to talk about neurons. So we have different types of neurons. Um, so sensory neurons are those ones that bring information to the sensory system, uh, the, sorry, the central nervous system from your skin, your muscle, your organs, all of that. Interneurons uh, associate sensory and motor activity in the central nervous system. So they're sort of in between. And then motor neurons send signals from the brain and spinal cord to your muscles that tell you to move. And you can see here, even though we've traditionally been taught that there's sort of one structure for what a neuron looks like, these different types of neurons actually might look a little bit different, particularly in the area of the dendrites. Glial cells are just as important as neurons, but not as glamorous, so they don't get talked about quite as much. So glial cells protect the brain and do other kinds of activities within the brain. So you have ependymal, um, and these will secrete cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that is throughout 
your brain and your spine that protects it, helps keep things in balance. Very important. Um, astrocytes uh, help essentially nourish as well as give support. Microglial cells are defensive. Um, so they're essentially like the white blood cells of your brain. And then oligodendroglial, sorry, uh, are uh, what forms the myelin sheath around your axons. Um, and that's really, really important. We'll learn later in the semester that when you don't have that myelin sheath, it can actually lead to many different neurological issues. And then you have what are called Chuan cells, and these create uh, the myelin in uh, the peripheral nerve. The brain is made of different types of matter. Brain matter um, is made up of neuronal cell bodies. Uh, this, the gray matter includes regions of the brain involved in muscle control, sensory perception, uh, memory, emotions, and speech. Uh, the white matter is uh, the tissue uh, through which messages pass between different areas of gray matter within the nervous system. So it's made of those axons covered in the glial cells, which is why it is white. Um, the brain in general can usually adapt to white matter damage uh, by finding alternate routes. It's just when that white matter damage becomes sort of system-wide that it, that becomes more problematic. Uh, the reticular matter is mottled white and gray, and um, that's where you get the cell bodies and axons together. Um, and when you go to look at the brain, uh, you can stain it in order to observe it during an autopsy. Um, and this is actually what you see on the right side of your screen. So this is an actual human brain um, stain so that you can look at the gray matter and the white matter differently. And you can see this mapped on to uh, a diagram of the brain, which is sometimes easier to interpret. So here, one of the things I want to point out is the ventricles which we're actually going to talk about on the next slide. Uh, so the ventricles are within the brain. Um, they are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and these are the dark patches that you see on brain imaging that we talked about already. Uh, they help with essentially keeping homeostasis, balance uh, within the brain. So they're very important in that way. Uh, the spinal cord is also extremely important, uh, and this shows you how the various vertebra are labeled um, and what they control. And if you are to get a spinal cord injury, for example, uh, they will designate it at what point you got that injury. So for example, a C4 injury. And the higher up you get that injury, so the more up into the cervical nerves, for example, uh, the cervical spinal area, uh, the more problematic it is. Essentially, it maps to where you have loss of function. Um, so someone with, you know, say, a, a T or an L injury might only have difficulties with their legs. Uh, you get up really high, and you have someone who is only going to be able to maybe uh, move muscles in their face. Now we're going to talk again very, very briefly about some of the anatomy of the brain itself. And we'll get into these more throughout the semester if we talk about damage to these areas, but it's good to start with a basic understanding. So we're going to start by talking about the brain stem. Uh, and it produces complex movement. It's responsible for our sensory and our motor functions. Uh, so it's really important and it regulates our complex function. It also regulates our cardiac and respiratory functions, again, very important to keep us alive. And um, it regulates the central nervous system in general. So uh, it is broken into several different areas. So we've got the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the diencephalon. So we'll start by talking about the hindbrain. So the hindbrain has the cerebellum, which you see here. Uh, and this coordinates and helps learn the skilled movements. Um, and the reticular formation, which is in this area, and in fact, I have a diagram where that's labeled, the red portion here, 
So the reticular formation controls sleep and waking and general physiological arousal. And then the pons and medulla, which you see labeled here, help with walking, sleeping, and locomotion. The midbrain uh, is composed of, again, several different parts. The tectum, which you see here, uh, is located dorsally, using some of that terminology we just went over. Uh, it gets your sensory input from your eyes and your ears. Uh, the tegmentum is located ventrally and uh, it is composed of areas that get input from the eyes and input from the ears uh, and it mediates orientation of movement to sensory input. So really important, right, that we move in regards to what we can see, what we can feel, so we don't injure ourselves. Uh, there's also the substantia nigra, uh, which is, deals with reward and initiation of movement. The red nucleus focuses on limb movement. And then you have uh, the paraequiductal gray matter, uh, which gives us species typical behavior and modulates pain responses. Then you have the diencephalon, um, and unfortunately I don't have a, ah, here we go. <laughs> I do have a diagram for this, apologies. So uh, we have the hypothalamus and the thalamus, and we have the diagram specifically of the thalamus here. So the hypothalamus interacts with the pituitary gland uh, and participates in nearly all aspects of motivated behavior. So things like feeding, sexual behavior, sleeping, temperature regulation, emotional behavior, movement, endocrine function. And then the thalamus, which is what we see illustrated here, uh, relays sensory information to appropriate areas of the brain, relays information between cortical areas, and relays information between the forebrain and the brain stem. So the thalamus is really important for making those connections throughout the brain. Um, and some of the areas you see here are pretty critical and we'll hear a lot about throughout the semester. And one example is the basal ganglia. Um, so the basal ganglia uh, basically is involved in controlling movement, not producing it, but controlling it. So we'll talk about several disorders throughout the semester where the basal ganglia are the problem. Uh, things like Huntington's, Parkinson's, Tourette's, for example. Now the limbic system is important because it's related to many important functions like emotion and memory. Um, and the name is a little bit of a misnomer uh, because it's named for connections between the olfactory system and the limbic lobe, but subsequent experience experiments haven't actually been able to prove that that connection exists. So um, definitely interesting. So here again are several uh, parts of the brain we'll hear about a lot over and over throughout the semester. So we've got the amygdala, uh, which has emotion and species typical behaviors. The hippocampus is really tied to memory and spatial navigation. When the hippocampus is impaired, you have major memory impairments. And then the septum uh, is involved in emotion and again, species typical behavior. And in Actually, most more recent research shows that uh, these areas of the brain play roles in emotional, sexual, memory, motivation, reward, and navigation. So they're pretty complicated, and again, uh, do relate to a lot that we'll, we will talk about throughout the semester. So the next thing we're going to talk about is what you may have learned already about the brain, right? So typically, when we talk about the brain, we talk about the lobes of the brain. Uh, so these are the major areas of the brain that control the functions we typically think about. So we've got the frontal lobe, which is right here, okay, right behind your forehead, and this controls uh, executive fun uh, functions. So these are essentially the CEO of your brain. So emotion, organization, uh, planning, attention, sequencing, judgment, social behavior, some motor skills, right? So really important, a lot of what makes us human, honestly. The parietal lobe, uh, which is 
here, sort of above your ear, um, really more of like top of the head. Um, the parietal lobe does your senses. So uh, it does both sensation, like the objective reality that this is hot, and perception, which is our subjective psychological experience. This is hot and painful to touch, right? It integrates all the information from the sensory neurons, and it allows us to engage in complex attention and awareness. So we can self-monitor because of the parietal lobe. And then the temporal lobe is more along here, okay? And that's your auditory function, which makes sense since the ears are right there, right? So memory, speech, and comprehension, uh, ability to lay down new memory traces for long-term memory and to retrieve information from long-term memory. Also the ability to output and input in language. And then the final lobe is back here and that's the occipital lobe and it focuses on visual functions. Now your book talks a lot about uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary areas. Uh, primary are the areas that receive projections from structures outside of the cortex and send projections to it. Secondary areas are adjacent to that and they get input from the primary areas. So they interpret sensory input or they organize movement. Uh, and then tertiary areas are sometimes called the association cortex. And these are between the secondary areas and they mediate complex activities. The last thing I do wanna to touch on is uh, just the idea of how the two halves of our brain interact. So uh, the brain tends to have contralateral organization. So each symmetrical half responds to sensory stimulation from the contralateral side. So if you remember, contralateral is essentially the opposite side. So what I'm seeing in this eye is processed by this side of my occipital lobe. So, and vice versa. Um, so this allows us to perceive visual fields or other senses uh, in a, uh, a way that we can integrate, but a way that's a little bit counterintuitive. All right, so we're gonna stop there. Hopefully this has helped you to kind of wrap your brain around some of the things we've been talking about.